Welcome to the 16th Family Lecture on Competition Policy in the Age of Algorithms, Challenges for Indonesia. My name is Utu Geniki Nati, or Niki. I am a lecturer at FABOE, and I'm so honored to chair this um, auspicious discussion today. Um, before we start, um, just a little note that we will be recording um, this lecture, and I hope um, it's okay for everyone. Um, LPM FMUE and the ANU Indonesia Project Recording in Progress have jointly organized the Sadli Lecture since 2007 in recognition of Professor Muhammad Sadli's great contribution to the public debate on economic issues and policy making in Indonesia for half a, for over half a century. The lectures are based on commissioned papers on Indonesia in comparative economic perspectives and published annually in the Bulletin of Indonesian Economic Studies. Professor Sadli has been a true inspiration to all Indonesian economists, including myself. Um, I would like to extend our most sincerest, sincerest gratitude to Professor Saparina Sadli and the Sadli family for their great support. Thank you also goes to the Australian Department of Foreign Trade, Foreign Affairs and for their continued support to the Sadli Lecture. Before we start, if Professor Saparina is willing, please may I invite Her Excellency to share with us her pearls of wisdom on how we can continue Professor Sadli's great legacy. Professor Saparina, we are so honored to have you with us. Professor, the floor is yours. Professor, um, you are still on mute. Thank you so much, Professor. Yeah, uh, because uh, I don't know anything about economics, of course, yeah, but the fact that the Sunday lecture is not only the 16th Sunday lecture, it's a very big honor to him and for me. Thank you so much for every, to everybody who is joining this lecture. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Professor, for your truly inspiring words. Um, your work um, and Professor Sadley's, the late Professor Sadley's work, have greatly invigorated our spirits, and hopefully um, these lectures can continue on. Thank you so much, Professor. Now, thank you. without further ado, yes, <laughs> thank you so much, Professor. <laughs> now, um, let us start our discussion today with our keynote address from Dr. Dr. Andes Chandra Satyawan, MM, PhD, Commissioner of KPPU Indonesia. Dr. Satyawan was appointed as Commissioner of KPPU or the Indonesia Competition. Um, this is his second term. Dr. Satyawan also very impressively has two doctorate degrees, one from the State University of Jakarta and the other from the Graduates Management at UPA Malaysia. Um, without further ado, Dr. Satyawan, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good to a very good morning um, to Professor Saparina Sadli and all speakers and participants. Thank you for this opportunity to represent uh, KPPU, uh, Indonesian uh, Competition Commissions, and deliver a keynote speech on competition policy in the aid of algorithms and its challenges for Indonesia. I would like to start my speech by stating that Indonesia's digital economy is growing at rapid pace. Many studies have confirmed in, uh, its potential in the future. Please, the next slide. Yes, a study report uh, launched by Google and Tamasek in 2021 stated that Indonesia's internet economy will likely reach $330 billion um, dollars by 2030, almost double the current Southeast Asia's digital economy value of $170 billion. Um, dollar. The rapid development of uh, digital markets in Indonesia is also affecting the competition's landscape. Let me go to the next slide. Yes, the number of MNA notification in digital market have been increased 
annually in uh, 2018, there were six notifications on digital markets, seven notification in 2019, 12 notification in 2020, and uh, 22 notification in 2021. We believe uh, this trend will continue, particularly with the, the rising of digital markets during the pandemic. On the policy side, the Indonesian government is now finishing up the roadmap on digital Indonesia 2021-2024. The main object objectives of this roadmap are to elaborate on the policy direction, its implementations, and the target outcomes to accelerate digital transformations in Indonesia. The roadmap on digital Indonesia is a strategic guideline to facilitate digital transformations in four sectors, which consists of digital infrastructure, digital governments, digital economy, and digital society. Distinguished participants, we are fully aware that in digital markets, business practices and models evolve fast, often faster than regulatory processes. The rise of new platforms and services effectively reshape existing markets and their competitive dynamic. There are also questions about the services they offer and the algorithmic pricing that they use. Some were new and thus escape current regulatory archetypes. Others fall between regulatory gaps that were not necessarily considered and many of these require new tailor-made measures. These challenges are faced by many countries, including Indonesia. As we can see in this slide, in general, there are several ways in which new business models in digital markets create regulatory uncertainty and challenges to competition authorities. It's dual and multi-role platforms Many digital services are by essence two-sided, allowing two user groups to benefit from a digital platform. Vertical and horizontal integrations. Vertical integration refers to a digital service provider acquiring businesses at multiple and different points in the supply chains. The, the network effects. Network effects arise when a product's value to one consumer increase, increases when it's also cons consumed by others. It's free services. Business models centered around the zero price provisions of products are not new. In the digital economy, new zero price markets have arisen. Is with their own unique characteristics and fast scope, it has become almost impossible by a consumer not to use at least one free um, digital product or service throughout a typical day. The use and control of data. Digital platforms and services rely on all types of data to be able to function properly. Despite this constant uh, flow of data, the reality is that there remain many barriers and impediments to the fast and secure transit of data across people, platforms, and borders. The algorithms and artificial intelligence, the possible use of sophisticated pricing algorithms and artificial intelligence to enter into collusions or which may lead to con conscious parallelism and their effects on competitions in the virtual market eventually becomes a policy concern. Next slide, please. Distinguished participants. Indonesia's competitions commissions currently follows soft approach in the digital market to tackle these problems. We have formulated six studies on the digital economy Two of them were formulated in 2017 and 2019. 
with the support of the Australia Indonesia Partnerships for Economic Development. And four of them were formulated in 2019, 2020, and 2021 independently by the commissions. The brief information about those studies is as follows. The report on the digital economy in Indonesia 2017 attempted to understand some of the emerging digital economy issues in Indonesia and their impact on competitions. It explains how digital services contribute to economic growth and employment, identifies key issues that may arise from the delivery of digital services, provides examples of Indonesia's approach to the issue, provides best practices from international organizations and different countries in approaching the issue, and identifies strategies to promote digital economy. The letter, Policy Brief and on Digital Platform Regulation 2019, examine digital platform issues and what this could mean for competition policy, how other economies are looking at these issues and what some of the emerging practices are in a relevant area. Next slide, please. From 2019 to 2021, the commissions developed four studies on digital markets, including a review of regulations and policies, a field survey of digital market partnership agreements, the structure and behavior of digital market companies in Indonesia, and relevant markets in the digital economy. These studies assist the commissions in understanding Indonesia's current policy framework and identifying, identifying practices. They may fall within regulatory gaps. They also inform um, policy framework that identified. Uh, they also inform the commissions on the current structure of digital markets, including the main players market shares and behaviors. Our market studies have not yet touched upon algorithms and artificial intelligence in digital markets, as we still need to develop adequate skills to dive into these particular issues. Distinguished participants, taking into consideration uh, the recent um, revolution, evolutions of digital markets, Competition law enforcers should be alerted to the risk that collusion might become easier to sustain and more likely to be observed with algorithms are involved. Quoted from a paper by Nidhi Singh of the University of Oxford, there are two main enforcement challenges uh, from algorithms and artificial intelligence. The first challenge is related to taxid collusions. It is easy to establish the existence of an agreement, but under the scenarios of conscious parallelism and artificial intelligence, it is difficult to establish an agreement per se. Thus, it might be relevant for the competitor, competition authorities to look at the anti-competitive intent in such cases. The question that needs to be addressed is whether the use of similar algorithms to distort competition without evidence of any illegal agreement could be brought as a violent of the competition law. Thus, the main challenge to the competition authorities is to expose the algorithm developers who program machines to unilaterally support taxes Solutions. But the competition authorities lack of the enforcement tools to do so. Therefore, in this case, anti-competitive intent uh, is a strong ground for establishing a, a cartel like activity. Legislation to counter excessive transparency can do its bit when the competitors in the market abuse this transparency. The second challenge is related to artificial intelligence, AI. The enforcement 
could be even more challenging in the, in the case of AI, as there is a complete isolation of the human element from algorithms making strategic decisions. With no express agreement, no anti-competitive agreement, and no human interference, what will be the futures of the implications of the competition law on AI? The answer to that at the moment could be the nobody can be held liable and an adverse, adverse impact on consumer welfare is an inevitable fallout of artificial intelligence. Distinguished participants. And these challenges demonstrate the, the digital market. Governments must adopt a more multifaceted and more nuanced approach, approach to regulation. Next slide, please. They must ensure the, their competitions and regulatory framework evolve along with market challenges, providing a solid foundation for sustained competitions, investment, and innovations that benefits consumers, business, businesses, and institutions, institutions alike. The competition authorities also need to ensure that we have adequate tools and skills to address the problems of algorithms driven economy. This is why close cooperations and collaboration with international competition authorities who have greater experience in this area is important. Last year, the commission was discussions enforcement issues in the digital, digital market, inspired virtual sessions with the United States Fair Trade Commissions, Japan Fair Trade Commissions, France Competition Authority, and Turkey's Competition Authority. Finally, to conclude my keynote speech, I must state that competition authorities cannot work alone maintain, to maintain a level playing field in this market. There is a need for collaborations between competition authorities and regulators to oversee this market. Institutional cooperation is important for this matter, not only to be made up, to be made, but also to be effectively implemented. We have a formal cooperation with the Ministry of Communication and Information, but I think it still needs to be optimized, specifically for the, the digital market. Only with a such good collaboration can the competition in digital market be created? Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Stiawan, for your words of wisdom, really clearly outlining the challenges Indonesia is facing with regards to digital development, and importantly, for understanding how the KPPU is supporting the establishment of just business practices in the tech world in Indonesia. You have given us a really great background um, for the discussion we will have today. Thank you so much, Dr. Sidiawan. Um, before we come to our key lecture, please may I ask everyone's permission um, to maybe switch their videos um, on if that if they are willing um, for a couple of seconds um, of a photo session. And um, please may I ask uh, Mbaniya uh, to help with regards to maybe doing the screenshot. And please let me know, Mbaniya, if uh, you have done the screenshot. Okay, uh, I think I will take those. Uh, okay, everyone is ready. One, two, and three. Okay, uh, once more. One, two, and three. Okay, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Kao Niki. Thank you so much, Matnya. And so now, we come to our highly anticipated key lecture. Um, before we start, may I just please request that questions from um, our audience be directed to the chat box on your screens. Um, we'll have a Q&A session to address these, uh, these questions at the end of the, um, of the lecture and of the discussion sessions. Um, thank you so much. So without further ado, 
I am very honoured to turn to Dr. Patty Lee, our distinguished speaker today. Dr. Lee has held academic appointments at the University of Wollongong, Nottingham University Business School in Malaysia and the University of Malaya. He received his PhD in economics from the University of California, Irvine, and his current research focuses on algorithmic economics, competition policy, structural change and political economy. He has published widely in a range of peer-reviewed journals, such as the Journal of Economic Dynamics and Control, the Journal of Economic Surveys, Computa Computational Economics, and many more. He is currently the co-managing editor of the Journal of Southeast Asian Economies and associate direct um, editor for the Journal of Economic Surveys, Asian Economic Journal, and Asian Economic Policy Review. So impressive, Dr. Lee. Um, without further ado, Dr. Lee, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, thank you, Nikki. Um, let me put up my slides to begin my uh, le lecture. Uh, okay, can you see my slide? Yes, we can, Dr. Lee. Yes. Um, let me begin my... Uh, lecture today by putting up uh, an, an acknowledgement. I'm quite a, sort of a, so uh, absent-minded person, so I thought it was a good idea to, to put this up front. Uh, let me thank uh, the organizers of this lecture who has kindly invited me to give this lecture, the Institute of Social and Economic Research, Faculty of Economics and Business, Universitas Indonesia, and also um, ANU Indonesia Project, Crawford School of Public Policy at ANU. And uh, I also have to thank the Ministry of Education Singapore, who through their social science research thematic grant has funded uh, much of the research uh, that I've undertaken for the past two years, which will form the gist of the findings that I will be presenting today. And lastly, of course, my, my institution, ICSU Sophisha Institute, who has always uh, supported uh, my research uh, in this area. Now, um, technological innovations um, has, since time immemorial, disrupted and transformed markets and industries. Right? In the latest phase, the emergence and evolution of the digital economy, uh, which is driven by digital inputs, uh, has been this kind of key drivers. And when I say digital inputs, this include uh, digital technologies, digital infrastructure, and digital services and data. And the kind of transformation that we see encompass many, many dimensions in the big classical sort of like economic dichotomies it will affect production, distribution, and consumption. One of the key questions that has emerged, has always uh, been asked, is whether the digital economy has improved life, right? As, uh, as, for, as in the case of all technological in innovation, you have a double-edged sword. You can have dividends in the form of, let's say, greater access to data and information, new consumption opportunities, and greater social connectedness, and which all appreciate during this pandemic times, I think, the ability to communicate uh, online uh, through even now, even through this uh, webinar. Of course, there are what you call uh, digital divides and downsides, right? In the form of polarization of labor markets, inequality, and of course, the topic of uh, this lecture, anti-competitive conduct in concentrated markets. These are the topics that are important. So, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I was wondering whether you could maximize your slide, if that's okay. Uh, let me see. Um, Thank you, Dr. Lee. Sorry for interrupting. Okay. Can it, is it okay? Yep, it, it's loading. I think they're maximizing. Thank you, Dr. Yeah, Lee. Okay. Sorry, for, sorry for interrupting. Thank you. Okay. Um, now, one of the things that, that we have to bear in mind is that um, the digital economy is not a static phenomenal entity. 
it evolves with changes in in um, digital technology itself and digital inputs. What you will see is when you have new kinds of digital inputs coming into the market, you it brings about new competition policy challenges. And this can be challenges related to structural issues that are brought about uh, by the fundamental characteristics of the, the technology and market, network effects resulting in concentrated market, which raises uh, merger issues in, in the tech industry. You also have behavioral issues that, that uh, we have heard uh, related to collusion, explicit tacit and abuse of dominance. What we of course need to do because of this, this evolution of technology bringing about new challenges, we need to contextualize competition policy in terms of evolution of digital technologies. And what we propose, what I propose to do in this lecture is to try and uh, give an understanding of the impact of uh, the use of a particular kind of digital technology, that is the algorithmic pricing on market competition, and then draw some broad implications uh, of algorithmic pricing for competition policy in Indonesia. Of course, the findings in, in that I present here is ongoing. The research has not been concluded. Uh, some are in completed, some are in preliminary uh, stages. And the structure of today's lecture is as follows. Uh, my earlier introduction will be followed by the evolution of digital technologies and competition policy, how it has changed over time. And then a brief reflection on what is the current state of uh, Indonesia's digital economy in relation to competition policy, uh, in particular the work that KPPU is doing. And, and then I go to the gist of, of my lecture to explore what are the competition policy challenges relating to algorithmic pricing, and then finally draw some policy implications. Dr. Lee, I'm yes. sorry to interrupt again, but your slides aren't move, moving. I think um, there's an error in, in loading them. Um, as a, oh, They're now loading. I don't think you might not be able to... Um, maximize your screen. Would it be helpful if Ibu Lydia shares her screen for you? And, and okay. that, would that would that be better? Thank you so yeah. much, Dr. Lee. Yes. Um, Ibu Lydia. Sorry. Yes, yes. Okay. Thank you so yeah. much, Dr. Lee, and yeah. sorry for the interruption. And um, We're talking and about the digital media. technology and <laughs> yeah. digital yeah. technology <laughs> problems. It's so ironic. <laughs> yeah, yes. Um, uh, next, next slide, please. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Next slide. Yeah, next. So this, yeah. Um, now, in terms of digital technologies and competition policy, we have seen uh, significant policy and regulatory interests uh, in competition in digital market and economies, right? Uh, if you've been reading the press for the past two to three years, you will see there is a strong resurgence in competition law enforcement focusing on large and dominant technology companies which are collectively known as big tech. Um, and this has been brought about by and shaped by innovations and evolution of digital technologies. And it's useful, as I mentioned earlier, to trace how this has evolved, how digital technologies have evolved and how they affect markets and industry. All right, next. Now, when we talk about digital technologies, of course, the foundation, the early days come from the, the early invention, uh, beginning from the 1940s, the invention of the transistor itself, that is the computational element of digital technology. And then in the 1960s, the early version of the internet, right, the ARPANET, which, which was implemented in the US, this is the communication aspect of the digital technology. And then when we move on to the 1960s, we see an explosion of computational and communication technologies. Some of the technologies that we talk about are microprocessor, uh, graphic user interface, and various internet protocols that allow uh, communication uh, between persons across uh, the internet. Fiber optics, cell phone, which you can see in the picture. I know the younger generation would probably not even recognize that the, the mobile uh, kind of phone was in that shape. 
Uh, and then emergence of video games and importantly, video compression technology, as well as the emergence of the com commercialization of, of uh, computational machine in terms of personal computers. Next. In the following decade, we saw a flourishing of uh, personal computing uh, and also in terms of uh, personal computers as well as software, uh, the emergence of uh, worldwide net invention, uh, uh, global positioning uh, satellite system. This was followed by an important decade in the 1990s, where which I characterize as the dawn of the e-commerce, uh, enabled by various technologies such as web browser, HTML coding, search engine, and of course the companies, the giants that we see today, all were founded during the 1990s. Amazon, eBay, Google, uh, in the US, and of course in China, Tencent, JD, and Alibaba. In the year, in the decade of 2000s and 2010, this is the period we are living in. This is the period or age of data, mobile broadband, digital platforms, and ecosystems we saw a refinement in terms of the creation of new e-commerce ecosystem that are enabled by new sort of technology uh, like AdWords uh, and, and uh, Android, Google Play, new kind of uh, equipments to access um, online uh, transactions, e-commerce, iPod, iTunes, iPhone, and also the Importantly, improvement in the in mobile infrastructure uh, uh, communication in terms of 3G and 4G. Uh, then a lot of apps like group chat apps, WhatsApp, Line, social media apps, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and the emergence of sharing economy um, by companies such as Airbnb and Uber. This was a period, uh, a period where the internet, e-commerce, digital economy truly flourish, I think. Next. Now, this is a table which I compile, which basically summarizes what I mentioned earlier, um, which will be published in the paper. And you can see in detail what are the kind of technologies and the timeline in which these technologies have and markets have emerged over time. Next. This is also uh, amplify what I mentioned earlier with all the timeline. Next. Now, when we see the earlier tables, when we see the earlier timeline, there is roughly a one decade plus, like 10 to 15 years lag between the emergence of new products, services, and markets, and some of the competition cases uh, that are related uh, to these uh, markets and products. Um, there are at least when we talk about um, a competition cases involving big tech, there are at least two phases. One in the 1990s involving the operation system and internet browser for personal computers. And more recently in the recent years uh, involving internet search, digital e-commerce platforms. Um, what you can see here is how, as I mentioned earlier, the emergence of new digital technology create new products, services, and markets and bring about new competition policy concerns. There are some, of course, uh, products that are new and different um, when you compare the first and the second phase. But a key underlying force that, that, is, that is sort of like, uh, that remains important are network effects that Apat Chandra mentioned earlier in his keynote address. That is, uh, this kind of effect will, will, will be in place when, you, when the demand for a product increases with the number of users for a particular product. So the more the number of people that have bought are using a product, the more attractive it is for new users to adopt the product. Next. Now, looking back for in the first phase, digital technology and competition policy in the 1990s, um, it begins, although the cases uh, took place in the 1990s, the initial sort of like genesis, you can see begins in the 19, a decade before that, when you have intensification of competition in the operation 
system market, uh, which subsequently uh, in which Microsoft emerged as dominant in the OS market for PCs in the 1990s. Uh, and the cases that were brought against Microsoft involve exclusionary and anti-competitive contracts with manufacturers, manufacturers of personal computer uh, and with the intention of unlawfully maintaining dominance in the OS market for PCs. That was in 1993. And then uh, five years later, again, uh, the cases involving PC manufacturers that were sort of quote unquote kind of like forced to license and install Internet Explorer browser. So moving from operation system to browser, uh, this, this kind of act deemed to sort of exclude competing browsers such as Netscape and, and also potentially be construed as predatory conduct by bundling the Internet Explorer into Windows for free. Next. Now, in the more recent uh, times, um, the regulators in the US, Europe, and China have been investigating big tech for anti-competitive practices. Uh, and cases have been brought against uh, big tech such as Google, Apple, Facebook, and Amazon. And some of the elements of this involve uh, issues tracks that can't restrain what merchants uh, in digital platforms could do outside the platform itself. Uh, and also some of the cases involve algorithms, but in different ways uh, in terms of some would look at search engine algorithm, involving let's say Google, and pricing algorithm, Amazon in this case. Next. These are the detailed table that I, I constructed for the paper itself. Uh, I won't go through it because uh, it's a bit uh, too much. I think we don't have much time, but it amplifies what I mentioned earlier. Uh, you can see in these numerous cases, the different different elements that are involved uh, in, in competition cases against uh, big tech. Next. Now, what are the, some of the drivers uh, in the recent competition policy cases? Um, one of it I deem as uh, the intellectual foundation for comp competition policy. There is an attempt now to shift uh, the sort of like uh, intellectual arguments supporting uh, competition policy. Um, this has been uh, a result of uh, critiques that relate, that sort of commented on the inadequacy of the Chicago School approach to antitrust analysis, which has focused on short-term price effects and consumer welfare. Uh, two examples of this would, for example, would be uh, the much cited paper by Lina Khan on discussing Amazon's uh, sort of like practice uh, that is critiqued as predatory pricing and and anti-competitive mergers, especially uh, involving uh, in terms of essential intermediary services. Then there is a paper by Srinivasan uh, that talks about Facebook that moved to this discussion where it's important to talk about non-price metrics such as users data as important factors in considering the effect of market dominance. So it's not longer about higher price because some products do not have price, but then you may have a degradation in quality uh, in terms of uh, data protection, for example. There are also, interestingly, uh, a second dimension, which is not often uh, discussed by economists in, in your typical sort of like competition policy courses. That is the, the political implications of market dominance. Uh, there is a discussion, there's a lot of discussion on sort of like the, um, the surveillance uh, economy or surveillance capitalism. Uh, one critique talks about Facebook's dominance, which uh, brings about broad scale sort of commercial surveillance, uh, which is deemed as a paradox in democracy. Uh, we have seen, of course, the, the, the cases uh, involved in Oxford Analytics was a clear example uh, in their influence in the US election, right? Uh, there is also uh, the critique, for example, by Tim Wu in his book uh, on um, 
large operations uh, or large companies operating in concentrated markets uh, can have potentially subvert democracy itself by capturing politicians. So these are both uh, some of the drivers in that have shaped recent argument. Next. In the US also, we saw the political transition also accompanied the shift uh, in, in uh, competition policy and enforcement uh, against big tech. Uh, the Biden's administration uh, have put a lot of emphasis on sort of restoring the vitality of the US economy by a more pro-competition kind of approach. Uh, this is also signaled by some of the major appointments uh, in, in the Biden administration. Tim Wu as the special assistant to the president for technology and competition policy, and Lina Khan as chair of the Federal Trade Commission. And of course, one of the first, one of the important acts that Biden uh, sort of like uh, undertook was the presidential executive orders uh, an action in July 2021 uh, that pushed pro-competition measures in internet services and put greater emphasis on, on greater scrutiny and restrictions on big tech, right? Next. Yeah, and beyond the US, we also saw a number of interesting developments that, that, that have been shaping uh, uh, competition policy in the digital economy. European Commission, for example, um, is coming up with uh, a new kind of regulation, the Digital Markets Act, uh, that uh, aim at regulating big tech, or the term they call it, large online platforms, Digital Service Act, that set the rules for digital services, including obligations of big tech companies. Some of the drivers of EU, that, uh, uh, of course, risk of big tech harming freedoms, opportunities, and democracy, which parallel what we saw the arguments articulated for uh, in the US. In China, of course, there was similar actions against big techs. Uh, they signaled the end of the observe then act kind of approach. Um, begins with the Chinese Communist Party announcement that they want to invigorate competition law enforcement to prevent the disorderly expansion of capital. Of course, in the last, I think, two to three weeks, we have seen a post potential reversal of this uh, kind of like um, move uh, by Beijing. Uh, in other countries, there are also competition law enforcement on big tech. Uh, there are cases in Germany, Netherlands, and Japan. In Southeast Asia, um, the, the most important, perhaps, uh, competition uh, policy law enforcement issue revolve the Grab Uber mergers in 2018, where cases uh, were brought against uh, uh, Grab. Uh, Uber uh, in the uh, jurisdiction of Singapore uh, and Philippines and also Malaysia in that case. But there has been nothing much uh, beyond that, I think, uh, in Southeast Asia, which is uh, important to think about. Uh, why has Southeast Asia not been more proactive in terms of uh, looking into uh, competition policy issues relating to digital economy. In this kind of scenario, perhaps it's important to look at what Indonesia has been doing. Next. Now, um, as uh, Pachandra has mentioned, um, Indonesia has the largest digital economy in Southeast Asia. It has a very vibrant tech startup sector with a few major unicorns. It is also, of course, one of the oldest and most active competition agency in Southeast Asia. Um, there are some of the activities uh, of KPPU that I, I noticed that are related to digital economy uh, can be traced all the way back, for example, in, in 2007. Uh, they are paper, position paper commenting on MOU between Indonesia government and Microsoft which is meant to sort of like legalize the Microsoft software and inadvertently make Microsoft a sort of like a monopoly a product in a public institution. Um, an important case, which I, which through my earlier discussion with some KPPU uh, officials and they brought me to this attention 
is the case involving in 2019, called case number 15, 2019, where um, it's a case involving concerted action or parallelism in pricing of airline tickets uh, by seven airlines. Um, they found parallel, uh, parallelism in pricing in the economy class ticket in the domestic market, um, but uh, there's no sort of like proof of formal agreement. This then result in a very complicated uh, sort of like situation where you see parallelism, which is something that looks like price fixing, but there is no cartel, which is under Act in Article 11 of the Act. So what happened is then a, a situation where there is perhaps a limitation uh, in terms of the remedies that uh, that can be used uh, by the competition authority, KPPU. In this case, the notification requirement on policing pricing practices by the firms. This is an interesting, although when you look at it, um, um, it doesn't, initially look looked like an algorithmic pricing, but in essentially it is because uh, a lot of, uh, almost all airlines use algorithms to price uh, the, the airline ticket. So it would be quite interesting to look into these cases in greater detail by look, looking at the algorithmic pricing mechanism. I would encourage for those who are interested uh, in, in, in this topic, I would encourage you to read the the uh, decision document. It's very thick, it's about 1,000 pages. Um, and it has interesting, uh, it's interesting because it has interesting uh, methodology that they use in terms of the kind of statistical analysis that are required uh, in when you undertake uh, sort of like uh, detection of, of collusive, tacit collusive practices. So I can say with these cases, KPPU has already actually begun to do some work to look at uh, elements of tacit collusion, actually. Um, of course, as uh, Pat Chandra has also mentioned, the KPPU has also undertaken a fair bit of capacity building activities and market study, which has highlighted the importance of studying the impact of algorithmic pricing. Uh, next. And these are some of the four cases which was earlier uh, mentioned by uh, Pat Chandra. What I want to highlight is perhaps the last one. That is uh, the last one which conducted in 2020. It's called Penelitian Pelaku Usaha dan Struktur Pasar for the sector economic digital. And one of the key takeaway which relates to the kind of uh, challenges that I want to talk about is they highlighted the need to establish a research unit or conduct of research based on computers aim at identifying anti-competitive business practice, which is exactly what we have been doing uh, in our research. And in particular also, they, uh, um, they also note that when you use algorithmic pricing, it makes it very difficult for competition agency to detect anti-competition practices using conventional means. Next. And from that, then we look at some of these challenges. Um, this is part of a project that, that I have been, and my team has been undertaking for the past three years. We wanted to look at several elements, uh, practice of algorithmic pricing, how extensive is it? What is, it, what is algorithmic pricing uh, and how extensive it is uh, in the market? So a market survey of it, which was carried out primarily in Singapore. And then we undertook a computer simulation to, computer simulation to study duopoly and, and ride sharing models with the idea of uh, incorporating AI and learning to see uh, and whether we can replicate and better understand how um, uh, machine learning uh, can bring about tacit collusion. We also undertook to, uh, to, uh, to do an empirical component uh, where we try to detect collusion in online grocery markets. Next. And this, of course, in, when we talk about detection of collusion, it relates to several elements uh, uh, that Harrington highlights. Uh, for example, uh, he talked about four methods of, of detecting collusion, whether firm behavior is consistent with competition. So whether, air, whether prices are correlated, how do prices respond to 
cost and demand shock. And you do see this method being applied, for example, in the KPPU uh, analysis for the airline ticketing cases. And second, whether there is a structural break in behavior, has the average price change, has relationship among firms price change, and has a variance of price and market share change. Again, this is also, these elements are also present in the KPPU study uh, or decision uh, study in, in for the airline ticketing uh, case. There are three and four, which I emphasize less, but uh, does the behavior of suspected colluding firms differ from that, that of competitive firms? Whether you can compare competitive price against non-collusive prices, which is also a way that we can undertake using statistical analysis. And a, a bit more difficult, of course, is the fourth one, whether a collusive model fit the data better than a competitive model. This is difficult to do because you then have to compare uh, real-world data with, with uh, a model that uses the data as an input. Next. Now, the first kind of, uh, one of the study we undertook, of course, was to, to look at collusion in a, in a ride-sharing platform. Uh, we look at the conventional analysis of, of collusion and we notice that it focused on price. But what if pricing in the centralized market, uh, uh, which are driven by demand and supply dynamically, and which vary across time. How do we look at how how do we look at price fluctuation, uh, and what if the uh, companies involved can pool their information on market supply, uh, adopting identical search pricing formulas? This is an issue where you have two firms using identical algorithms to set prices, and then we simulate and see how does it actually look like next. And the model is that you have you have a ride sharing model which we we built in which uh, uh, it's in a circle where consumers and cars are randomly located across the circle and it moves over time. Uh, consumer move by taking ca uh, cars that are available uh, from either uh, the two supplier, let's say Gojek and Grab, and the choice will be based on which supplier would offer a lower price. And this is the kind of simulation we undertake uh, over time. Next. And the results that you see, of course, uh, are partly driven by the algorithms here. Uh, and the algorithms price at each location at each point of time depends on the number of cars that are available compared to the number of people wishing to take a ride. So the more imbalance uh, in terms of if there's excess demand, more people and not enough cars, the price will go up. Uh, there are several assumptions about uh, drivers can only serve for only one company, but passengers can choose between companies. Next. And the kind of simulation results that you see is this, right? That when you look at the top left, uh, bottom left, you see price fluctuation over time. Uh, but then when you look at the market share, bottom right hand side, what you see is that uh, the market share is almost constant. So by looking at price, you cannot get, especially over time, you get the false impression that it's competitive market. But when you look at market share, you realize it is not. When you look at price by location, you do see that price are pretty much different, uh, uh, but then quite stable over time. Next. Uh, we also can also try and do sort of like um, uh, simulations to, to, to figure out how difficult it is to detect collusion, uh, especially in, let's say, uh, ride-sharing platforms that we've been using where price vary over time, uh, as well as by location. So this will generate a big kind of data with multiple dimensions. Can we detect collusion by looking at price correlations by location? Right? How do we compare price over time? Do we compare price distribution? Next. These are computer generated price by the two platforms. What we can then do is we can run uh, correlation statistics and see that they're highly correlated when you use the same kind of like uh, algorithms. Next. Of course, when you, next, when you, when you, when you, no, go back to the earlier one. When you lengthen the, uh, simulation to uh, in terms of 
iterations, more time, you do see change in terms of uh, correlation across space and time. So it's important when you analyze uh, digital markets and price code, it's important to look at the time dimension uh, carefully, uh, which time period, how long is it? Because if you take a snapshot of different time, it can give you a, a sort of like false impression. Next. We can also compare uh, the distribution uh, uh, across uh, the, the two sort of like supplier to see whether uh, the prices are correlated. Uh, you can use, for example, a test called the Spearman rank test, where uh, when you run this kind of, if you have a sufficient data, you can use a statistical test to, to then check whether you have the same kind of distribution. Uh, uh, what you would do find is uh, collusion when the same, will you find collusion when the same pricing algorithms are used? So what you can do is you can, you can run different simulation to test out with different sort of algorithms to see whether uh, the distributions are identical or, or different. Next. Okay, one interesting uh, thing that we did with the simulation is what we do, what we call collusion via a stochastic markup. Now, in simple term, imagine uh, two companies wishing to collude, right? What they do is they, they'd they have a markup on, let's say, the product price, let's say, uh, two ride sharing operator. And this markup is a random markup or stochastic markup where the price will vary between zero to let's say 10%, right? And each time at each iteration, what the software do is it will pick up a random number between zero to 10, and it will then randomly take that number, it will take the run randomly generated number to do the markup. So when you have that, can you still detect that? So this, this raises an important issue uh, next. Now, the diagram on the left is before you undertake the random markup, the one on the right, when you have the random markup, right? Of course, the scale of the axis are a bit different. What it shows is that on the right-hand side, the price, the fluctuation prices, the prices are fluctuating at a higher level. Next. So when you begin to compare, let's say in, the, in a random markup of 50%, extreme enough, what you see in the statistical distribution is a shift in the it's in the distribution to the right, indicating that on average prices are higher, right? What if you then reduce the markup by less than fifty percent? Next, this is ten percent against five. What you begin uh, noticing is that as the of course as the percentage of random markup become smaller and smaller, it becomes less and less discernible. If you're a competition agency, when you're looking at the data, uh, you cannot tell anymore whether there is a collusion on fixing the prices using random markup when it's low enough. Next. So this raises important issue uh, that in terms of, can I have a slide before that? Yeah, okay. This raises the important issue of what would be the percentage um, uh, threshold that competition agency need to adopt when they look at uh, markup pricing. Next. We have also attempted to, to run collusion models with learning. Uh, and this is, this is uh, to address some of the challenges that Pat Chandra mentioned uh, about the difficulty of uh, uh, dealing or detecting uh, tacit collusion. Um, there is a, when we do this, I won't talk about it in detail. One of the key challenges uh, in this kind of research and for competition authorities is to better understand the different kinds of learning mechanism and what are the cons consequences for tacit collusion. One of the big challenge that we found is how do you deal with uh, deep learning where data is fed uh, and which takes into account both personal data, consumer characteristics, and prices. It's a useful exercise to undertake, but very difficult. Next. Uh, and another area which is, which is difficult to do is collusion screening for online markets. 
Online markets uh, can be very complicated, uh, especially digital platforms that offer multi-product nature. Uh, one way to study this is to look at market shocks and how to and then see how price responds uh, among sellers and uh, when you have excessive pricing. Uh, it's useful to, to look at the different kind of screening methods and see whether prices are correlated and whether the pricing algorithms used by sellers uh, 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 whether they actually use algorithms. Next. Dr. I think I'm, yeah, I'm running out of right time. No, it's all right. you, have, no, you have another five minutes, Dr. Lee. Thank all right, you let so me much. go to, um, okay, maybe I'll skip this one. Next. Yeah, so some of the met statistical uh, metrics that we use are the four moments of a statistical distribution, the mean, variance, skewness, kurtosis, and of course, comparing distributions by using stochastic dominance test. And when you have when you have reduced competition, you then see specific results that you expect, uh, higher mean price and lower price variation in terms of lower variations, etc. Next. Okay, next. Because we're running out of time, uh, I think I overestimated. So we basically, the slide before that. What we did is uh, we, uh, for the Singapore market, we collected uh, price daily price for 99 products over a period of more than two years by four sellers, Amazon, Cold Storage, FairPrice, Lazada. Uh, next. And what you see is uh, we then look at uh, how the COVID shocks appear. When are the different, different periods where COVID cases are very, very, very high? That would indicate that you may, in some cases, people are afraid to buy from physical stores. They're going to buy online. And in some cases, if you have lockdowns, they can't even go and buy from physical stores. They have to buy from online market. Next. And we compare different, different shock periods uh, and we identify what would be the normal period. What we did next. What we then do is we compare that. What we found that is the results are consistent. When you have shocks, uh, we do have reduced competition for some products, especially when we pull all the shocks together and compare it to the normal period. But when we compare shock periods with another shock period, the results are kind of weaker. It might then be then useful to investigate uh, price correlation. Next. This is a, a bird's eye view of the showing. The yellow indicates where the results for a particular product confirm the hypothesis that when you have shock, uh, you indeed have lower competition by the different different measure. Gray means you have negative results. So it's kind of a mixture uh, across the different different product, which shows you the complexity if you are a competition agency trying to look at nine, 99 products, 100, 200 products over time, you might have very, very different results and, and correlation. Next. Uh, we also look at then, um, price correlation. It's important to look at this because uh, price adjustment can occur to uh, pass through by retailers, by supplier to retailer, retailer to consumer. And then, and competitors can also react to, uh, a firm can also react to their competitors' prices and stock availability. For example, if your competitor do not have stock, you can increase your price. And one of the area we couldn't look at, of course, is personalized pricing. Next. Um, and this is one example. You, you look at two brands for rice. Uh, you have four sellers. You can see that pr price fluctuation different. And it, it can also tell you which firms are using uh, algorithms, most likely Amazon and Lazada, and which firms are not using Next. Uh, and when you look at some products, it's very interesting. Notice how the price staggered almost coincide uh, in some cases. But this, of course, did not does not indicate that the source of price change is not due to algorithm. It's probably due to the wholesaler, perhaps, uh, uh, adjusting prices. Next. This is another kind of cooking oil, uh, staggered price. Next. Uh, and Indonesia, you see kind of like, uh, if you look at some of the online supplier, this is the sunflower oil. Only uh, only Shopee, I think, I found fluctuation in prices where the other don't have much fluctuation. Next. 
This is for Indomie uh, over time. Next, this is for next uh, Ultramel. Uh, this is quite unusual. Why there is a sort of like a staggered, I don't know whether this is like a weekend effect that merits uh, further investigation. Why, why is the algorithm driving this kind of price change? Next. Uh, we can also estimate price correlation to see whether how much of interdependent pricing is undertaken. Next. Uh, and these are some of the results. Uh, high correlation between some of the suppliers. Next. And interestingly, you can see a very, very high correlation among uh, the two suppliers for this particular product. Next. Um, I will leave this to uh, next. And one interesting uh, thing that can also be done, uh, allow me this as the final two more minutes, is that it would be also be interesting to look at pricing and platform across industries, right? For example, Lazada has sells uh, this similar product across different, different markets. What will happen whether if when you use the same algorithms or we don't use algorithms across markets? Next. Uh, this is the price of uh, Singapore left-hand side. Uh, uh, no, the Indonesia left-hand side. Nescafe uh, 200 gram instant coffee and right-hand side, Singapore prices. And you can see the differences uh, uh, in terms of price fluctuations in the two market. Um, and then when you, next, when you look at the same uh, company, uh, Lazada, uh, in Indonesia, which is in the blue one, in Singapore, you can you can see the price uh, change uh, stability or level over time across two markets. So this raises interesting, uh, important challenge cross border. Next. So finally, I will briefly go through the policy implications. Uh, algorithmic pricing has important impact on competition. There are downsides and dividend. Uh, this new, capacity, new capabilities are important for competition agencies such as KPPU, multidisciplinary skills and infrastructure. Uh, new approach and tools are needed. Automated statistical analysis, data mining for collusion screening. Access to big data is important, enabled by detailed official specification of what is required, consistent with uh, Personal Data Protection Acts. Uh, there's also the law itself might be a constraint, as Pachanda mentioned. Uh, tacit collusion and may require new regulatory approaches. Uh, one may think about sectoral regulation, consumer protection could be used to complement uh, what is done by competition agency. There is also a need to investigate how digital platforms operate across several countries. Uh, the last slide that I showed in, in terms of pricing of products uh, uh, across different markets, uh, how pricing algorithms affect this. Um, um, sorry, I've had to rush my, my lecture and I thank you for listening. Perhaps I can elaborate a bit more about uh, some of these challenges uh, during the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee. That was truly amazing. The amount of information that you shared was just outstanding and um, I think I speak for everyone but we, we really learned a lot from your lecture. It was just so exciting to see the methods, particularly the methods you showed for detecting collusion. I can really see their value, um, particularly for governments such as Indonesia to help support the formulation of, of, of sound policies. I'm now I'm just so eager to welcome our discussants and to listen to their input on your great work. So now, a very warm welcome goes to our first discussion. Ng is lead advisor for the Southeast Asia region at the Economic Research Institute um, for ASEAN and East Asia, or ERIA, and she was appointed um, in Jan 2020. Um, from 2017 to 19, Dr. Ng was appointed as lead advisor to the Ministry of Trade of Indonesia and senior advisor on trade and investment at the President's Office of the Republic of Indonesia from 2015 to 16. In addition, she has also represented Indonesia at numerous international forums, such as the G20 Trade Ministers Meeting in 2018 and the WTO Trade Ministers Meeting 
um, in 2018 and 19, Dr. Ng has written numerous articles, edited books, and has been widely published in many reputable peer-reviewed journals. Um, we really, we are waiting in eager anticipation for your new edited book on robots and AI, a new economic era, which, if I'm not mistaken, will be out in June 2020. So, Dr. Ng, we're so excited to listen to your comments. Um, without further ado, Dr. Ng, the floor is yours. Thank you, Nikki. Uh, it's such a great pleasure to meet all of you today, as Indonesia is the G20 president this year. So in this session, let's discuss G20's role in ensuring digital transformations development for all. Let me start with the fact that in 2016, the top 1% of the world's populations own half of the global wealth. And just over the last two years, the income of 99% of global populations has worsened off, while the income of the top 10 richest persons has doubled just over the last two years, of which eight out of 10 are technology titans. Next, digital transformations is one of the most crucial aspects that changes modern human life. It starts from industrial robots to artificial intelligence or AI. Over a decade, the annual number of installations of industrial robots worldwide has more than doubled, reaching around 400,000 in 2021, China, Japan, the US, Korea, and Germany accounted for 76% of total industrial robot installations. At the same time, in the last five years, investments in AI increased by almost sixfold from 13 billion US dollar in 2010 to 68 billion US dollar in 2020. Next, digital transformations reduces the cost of sharing information, leading to unprecedented changes in what and how we are trading. Digital trade increased more than 10 times in 20 years. So we can imagine just in 20 years, it increased more than 10 times from less than 1 trillion US dollar in 2010 to more than 10 trillion US dollar by 2030. So it's the size of digital trade is like the US economy is like 20 trillion US dollar. So the size of digital trade is like half of the US economy with the growth of about five times of the Chinese economic growth. So we can see how big digital trade is and will be. Next, the current COVID-19 pandemic has even accelerated digital transformations and digital trade. The development of digital trade includes digital payments and digital delivery services. As we can see here, uh, the y-axis is the value of the retail global e-commerce sales. And we can see here that the global retail e-commerce sales in 2021 increased by almost 50% from the 2019 levels that is prior to the pandemic. Digital trade was recorded 4.9 trillion last year, estimated to grow 5.5 trillion US dollar this year and reach more than 10 trillion US dollar by 2030. Next. So all in all, digital transformations improves productivity and trade. Digital advances can help human to work faster and in greater precision and accuracy and thus reduce overall productions and operational costs. Industrial robots and AI can also help market 
to function more efficiently and will improve overall human welfare. While digital transformations and digital trade improves productivity and trade, it also raises inequality in at least two ways. First, displacement effects, capital and technology take over tasks previously performed by labor and automation reduces the labor shares value added, right? That will bring consequences on employment and wages, particularly for skill, less skilled workers that can be easily or uh, can be easily replaced by robots or AI. Second, premature deindustrialization effects. Digital transformations may also bring impacts on developing countries. One of them could be premature deindustrialization and disappearance of manual and routine jobs. Next, on top of key challenges of inequality issues, we face key challenges in digital transformations and digital trade. First, privacy. Private individual information and data are exposed to services provider, including pervasive exchange of data that has fuel concerns about the use and misuse of data. Second, cybersecurity. The expansions of rapid digitalizations and the use of data by businesses and consumers for communications, digital trade, and a source of access to information and innovations comes along with increased threats. Threats against data, against systems, against people. Third, competitions. Technological advancements enable firms to produce and operate in large, in large, huge, massive economies of scale across borders that build up market concentrations. Market concentrations reduce competitions and can be barriers for MSMEs and startups to be in the same level playing field with big tech players tend to use integrations as their strategy to dominate markets and to um, capture more revenues at the cost of consumers, society. Last, digital divide. Digitalized systems and digitally deliverable goods and services still account for lower shares in developed in least developed countries than in other parts of the world. Just to give you an idea, only 2% of populations in low income countries conducted digital trade. Countries, firms, and individuals are greatly varied in their digital transformations and trade readiness, depending on our education, skills, and infrastructure. Next. So considering the advantages and challenges in digital transformations and digital trade, I believe G20 is an effective forum to manage global digital transformations. So what can G20 do and what Indonesia as the G20 president should endorse? First, improve the quality of key digital enablers which include data security and governance, law and regulations, digital infrastructure, and skills. At the end of the day, digital transformations is about skills, it's about people. Second, continue to promote efforts to improve preparedness for digital and AI technology, including providing incentive and necessary supports for good technology adoptions particularly for developing and least developed countries. Let me uh, last improve the quality of privacy law and competitions or antitrust law. And it is crucial 
to ensure the implementations worldwide. Let me end by reminding that I am a representative of 99% of global populations who are facing key challenges in digital transformations and digital trade in our daily life. Privacy, cybersecurity, unfair competitions, and digital divide. I hope our discussions today can contribute to ensuring digital transformations development for all. Thank you. Thank you, Ibu Lili. Um, really, thank you so much. In a very short amount of time, your analysis truly was truly able to synthesize the main challenges econo uh, economies are facing in the midst of digitalization, where digital transformations can benefit societies, improve welfare versus where developments can um, increase inequality. Your comments also highlight um, the role the G20 has as a great forum to um, ensure um, that um, nations embrace equity as we all continue um, to um, enter the digital world. Um, truly great food for thought and um, for, for us all um, and, and for researchers and, and to improve, um, I guess, uh, to, as input also for Dr. Lee's work. I now come to our second discussant, Dr. Um, Chaikal Nuryakian. I'm, I'm so honoured to be able to say this, but I was his student back in 2008 in his econometrics class. So just a little bit of an overview of Dr. Nuryakin's amazing career. Um, Dr. Nuryakin obtained his bachelor's degree in economics and master's in economic science from FMBUE. He then studied at the National Graduate Institute for Policy Studies in Tokyo, Japan, and obtained his Master's of Arts and then um, PhD in Economics in 2015. Dr. Nuryakin is now the head of the undergraduate economics program at the Department of Economics at FMB UI. Dr. Nuryakin is also the head of the Digital Economy and Behavioral Economics Research Division at LPEM FMB UI. Dr. Nuryakin, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Nikki. Could you hear my voice? Yes, Mapa, thank you. Yes. Uh, so let me first, uh, I have a disclaimer because I think my discussion will be based on the shared paper and Professor Lee presentation is so much more deep, so much more broad. So yeah, hopefully I could just add some values on the study. So let's start. So this is just the highlights of the paper, and I have already mentioned it that this is uh, very much uh, maybe like partially uh, uh, on the on the presentation of the professor Lee. So the paper provides narrative on network effect on market dominance and development of computer algorithms, and somehow elaborate on key challenges for competition policy in Indonesia, and provide cases on how to detect algorithm pricing. And it is very much uh, already nice, yeah, very deep and brought in the PowerPoint. And uh, next. So on the network effect itself, right? The network is uh, actually essential for digital uh, platforms. Michael, I'm so yes. sorry to interrupt, to interrupt you, but uh, we can't really see you. Your camera, if it's okay, uh, would you be able to kind of like, there we go, there we go. We can okay. see you now. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, because I'm outside now. Uh, okay, so the network is actually essential for digital platforms and the bigger the network, the more efficient the platform for sure. So it is just like kind of natural dominance or natural monopolies in the basic uh, microeconomic theory, right? So uh, in conventional sense, is, is it natural that they, they, they will have the dominant in the market, right? And for sure, uh, this uh, uh, market dominant will have also benefits for the economy because that's already mentioned it's economies of scale and the uh, the cost of production will be uh, more efficient if they have like uh, uh, decreasing uh, decreasing costs right and uh, yeah somehow nevertheless uh, digital problem will abuse also their market dominance so maybe because this monopoly and oligopoly is just valid for the government to intervene in the market right Nevertheless, like it is evident that even the network itself in the advancement of technology is not stable, right? This is by Tucker in 2018, and partly because of the lower cost of switching, switching for the consumers. So this is very different with the conventional uh, markets that 
yeah, it's very hard try right, to switch consumers in the traditional markets. But in the digital economy, you just could be just switching uh, between platforms, switching between Facebook, and even like the, the new generation maybe don't, doesn't like Facebook. <laughs> they don't doesn't like WhatsApp, right? They don't WhatsApp. They just are doing uh, line. I don't know why, right? So they just uh, so. I mean, competition will always there, right? Uh, a different generation with different tastes uh, and different, uh, and it is also induced with the lower cost of switching. Next. And for the, uh, on the algorithm itself, right? Pricing algorithm is only one of the various algorithms used by platforms. They have many like, like not just pricing alg uh, alg algorithm, but they have also called consumer algorithms, right? So, uh, it, it helps the consumers, right? Because uh, what's so-called micro-targeting, uh, they, they, they could customize this, their consumers' needs. So for me, this is very useful, right? If I search, or I'm, looking, I'm looking for a product and they just, just come up with the, exactly what I want, right? So this is, uh, for me, this is like uh, making, uh, uh, it's efficient for me to, to, to buy uh, a product. And somehow also micro targeting could just uh, be used in price discrimination because maybe yeah, the price for Nikki <laughs> is very much higher for the price for me uh, because they have, uh, the, the platform have a historical, historical uh, purchase of Nikki and me. And they know that the purchasing power of Nikki may be higher than me, right? So uh, there should be uh price parallelism but maybe we also have like another issue on price discrimination and somehow yeah uh, the job platform could yeah it could be decrease the competitive behavior and it could be also increase competitive behavior but i will uh, discuss it later and yeah the paper i think the paper uh, should be on the paper as be differentiated who is doing the algorithm right because it is different between right sharing and e-commerce platforms but actually the professor Lee president has already done that right so this is in the case of right sharing is the is the platform but in e-commerce is with the sellers right uh, or the merchant in on the platform doing the uh, uh, price algorithm next And this is on the algorithmic pricing, right? So this is this uh, previously is the general algorithm algorithm uh, design. So this is on the specific on algorithmic pricing, and this has already been. I think it's already uh, yeah. KPP already aware on this. Professor Lee also already aware on this because the challenge is that they are autonomous, independent decision. We know in game theory, we know we have a strategic interdependence, but here. They, they just machine, there is a robotic optimization, then who, who, who's the one who's going to be punished on the, on the conduct, right? And, and we, we are going to back to the uh, basic problem of collusion, right? Whether is it tacit or whether is it versus explicit collusion, but it has already been aware by the yeah, Professor Lee and also the Pachandra, right? Uh, we, yeah, we, we we definitely going to the explicit collusion yeah, for the for the, the for the legal fabric, right? And what's happened if there should be a different uh, uh, only small portion of merchant use algorithm pricing? So it should be different, right? Between whether all of them are using algorithmic pricing and maybe only small portion of merchant use it. So which one is yeah the impact on the consumer? The impact on welfare will be will be very different. And we have, yeah, in digital economy, for sure, the low menu cost, right? So, yeah, I expect, actually, this is a little bit anecdotal, right? I expect uh, uh, price seeking is less prevalent in digital platforms rather than in conventional market because the platform or the, the merchant could be just, you know, change the price easily, right? Uh, and even may, maybe with very low cost uh, compared to the in the conventional market so the price will be more dynamic or maybe the price could be just converge to multiple equilibria so there is like multiple parallel price happens to be there but yeah professor lee already uh, discussed about it also but it, seemingly there is no such kind of phenomena in the in the uh, in the platform but i don't know yeah but yeah basic logic is should be there and 
yeah, even yeah, even if there is parallel pricing, yeah, this is already been aware. Also, this is not enough for pollution fabric, even in the conventional industries, right? Because this is a rational economic behavior, and parallel pricing is could be just uh, affected by other than collision behavior, right? It could be just the the structure of the cost in the job performance is just similarly the same, the same, and maybe it's just very nearly to zero, and then yeah. We could expect that the parallel pricing is would be yeah, will be there right? because of the parallel uh, structure of the cost. So there are a lot of things to be considered, and yeah, I do uh, I do aware that the professor really already mentioned about how to uh, make sure uh, um, make sure us that the 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 the, 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 the pricing outcome is indeed because of the. Uh, collision behavior, right? We, we must be careful about that. Okay, next. And however, this is the paper by Whisking and Heron, right? Actually, the algorithm could facilitate explicit collision behavior, but yeah. So if we have, if we, in the case of explicit collision, uh, actually this algorithm pricing could be used in the setting the price or used to monitor prices agreed between competitor or can be used to implement the pre-existing explicit collusions. Yeah. So the, yeah, but, but the case is very difficult, right? We have, we have to prove that is, there should be an explicit collusion and then it exists, then the algorithm pricing could be used to facilitate this explicit uh, collusion behavior. Next. And this is maybe for, yeah, in the general uh, perspective, uh, digital economy versus conventional, so I think uh, this is my personal point of view. Uh, the competition is higher in the digital era since consumers are just a click away for comparing prices and products, right? Uh, by clicking away some multiple platforms, uh, I have Gojek and I have Grab, so I just switching between them and I compare the price and it should be uh, the, the, the price is more competitive. And yeah, there's, uh, it's already, I already mentioned about this price discrimination price discrimination rather than price collusion might be more prevalent because yeah the the algorithm uh, this is just like we have platform to have perfect information on the purchasing power or e of each of the buyers right such as this is the first price discrimination conduct of the uh, platform and this is uh, the less is different, should be there is a different impact on segment, segmented consumers because there are many, I think there is many different type of consumers and a platform could be just differentiate their price uh, to the specific consumers. And somehow we know in digital, in digital uh, platform, yeah, consumer decision to buy is somehow driven not just by price, Right, but also on the information reveal or uh, information searched by them, right? So the information is important, and maybe price signal is not too effective, right? And also we are very aware that we we buy something because of like the status of the merchants, right? So their ratings, reviews, right? Other than price that make the uh, 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 that affected the decision, uh, buying decision of the, the consumers. And so, yeah, in this case, so the platform indeed play a role in shaping, the, in shaping the competition of the merchant in the platform, right? They could also like uh, inducing competitive behavior or they could just inducing uh, uh, non-competitive behavior. So it depends on the authority, whether they want to cooperate with the platform. Right, because the platform do indeed play a role, right, uh, in inducing the uh, competitive behavior. Next. Okay, Jaika, sorry, you yes. have um, one moment. Okay, so it is in the con in the same context, right? Uh, so it is better to differentiate, right? Right, sharing and digital platform uh, and Uber and Grab in campus will be very much different with Gojek and Grab. Yeah, it seems yeah, anecdotally, right? Gojek and Grab, yeah, yeah it's rival to death. <laughs> But it's just anecdote, and I think it should be different. Uh, the analysis should be different between the market concentration within e-commerce, right? So the merchants in the commerce competition of the merchant in in, in within the uh, in commerce, 
and or or the competition between e-commerce itself, right? E-commerce platform itself. So the concern on the e-commerce uh, non-competitive behavior should be focused on the platform fee, preferential ads fee, and also preferential access of other services, right? That KPP could monitor. Right. But I think KPO already concerned about this, right? Uh, rather than on the merchants, uh, merchants non-competitive behavior. And in Indonesian context, there are lack of digital literacy on consumers, right? Uh, as I already mentioned, this price must be less effective as signal. And there will be, yeah, this is for KPP information rents, right? Could be higher in Indonesia, uh, you know, the, I think you are familiar with Dropsy percent. They don't have the goods, but they charge price uh, much higher than the original seller. Next. And this is the last thing uh, for KPPU, right? Uh, that is available, more accessible, but it, it, it becoming more complex, right? And that's the phenomena. So I just want to note it about the impact evaluation, right? Before and after analysis is not enough. Right, simulation is okay, but maybe in the real, if we use real data, there are many factors. Right, uh, uh, why maybe the para, parallel price uh, to be happening? Right, so it should be, yeah. We have, we have, luckily we will have like a control group, yeah, in order to uh, make sure that this is because of uh, collusion behavior. And for sure, yeah, Professor Lee uh, studies uh, available ways, right, of analyzing data to give an indication of cooperative behavior. And I think KPP should also focus on ex ante regulation, right? So just prevent them to do to do it to do to police behavior. And the last is I think KPP is just not, just not to cooperate with ministries, right? Capable could cooperate with platforms, right, to encourage smart competition in the platforms. I think that's all, Nikki. Thank you. Thank you so much, Taika. Uh, Thank you very much for your great discussion points. You highlighted the importance of Dr. Lee's work, highlighted key issues that Dr. Lee discussed in his paper. Thank you also for your comments on adjusting, possibly adjusting the price algorithm models to include issues such as price discrimination strategies and collusion behaviors. Um, and thank you also for your last highlight um, on policy needs for Indonesia. Thank you again, Bapa. So before we give the floor back to Dr. Lee to respond to um, Ibu Lili's and Pa Chaikal's comments, I will now start our Q&A session. We already have a great question from Pa Pros on gains and losses for consumers um, um, due to algorithmic pricing. And I think we will have the pleasure of um, welcoming Pat Ross to ask this question in, in person. Um, Pat Ross, please go ahead. The microphone is yours. And if you can, um, switch your video on, if that's okay. Um, please okay. go ahead, Pat Ross. Thank you. You can hear me okay? Yes. Yes, I okay. can. Yes, we can. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Matt and Nikki, and thank you to all of the speakers and indeed to everybody who's uh, organised this uh, great Sudley lecture for this year. Um, uh, this is not, not my field and it's not something I've taken any notice of in the past, and so it's a very stimulating seminar from that point of view. But my concern is that uh, in all of this sort of technical discussion, I haven't heard any uh, discussion of the magnitude of the possible losses that uh, might be suffered by consumers. Um, uh, my impression is, uh, I'll just take us uh, one question, is that companies like Uber and also Gojek um, brought immense benefits to the general public um, because the general public was previously restricted to rather poor taxi services and rather poor OJEC services. And so those companies, when they made their appearance, they were very much welcomed by the traveling pub public. Um, but it seems to me that people with a fondness for government regulation seem interested only in finding fault with these kinds of companies. And I, I think that's, um, that's misguided. I, I think that the losses to consumers from algorithmic pricing and so on are probably trivial. In fact, they might be gains rather than losses. And I worry that losses from an extension of regulation into these fields would be vastly greater. So I'd ask you all to cast your minds back 
if you're young and if you're old enough to uh, to the time when we didn't have Uber and we didn't have Gojek and things like that. We we here in I'm in Canberra. Uh, what we had was a taxi service, and that taxi service was regulated by the government. And the effect of that regulation was to prevent new entry into the industry. And the natural consequence of that was to hold taxi fares way higher than they needed to be. So this is uh, an example of regulation that is clearly not in the interests of consumers. And it, it really bugs me, I suppose I could say, that uh, people seem to want to jump on, on companies like Uber and Gojek, who are clearly performing a great service to the, the general public. So what I guess my question, uh, perhaps to Professor Lee, but possibly also to the other speakers is, do we have any reason to believe that the magnitude of the consumer losses that you seem to be concerned about are actually big enough to worry about? Thank you very much. Thank you, Pat Rice. That was a great question. Um, and now we now turn to Dr. Lee um, for maybe um, a couple of words um, to respond to um, Ibu, Ibu Lili and Pat Chaikal's comments. And then um, Pat Rice's great question. Uh, please go ahead, Dr. Lee. Um, I will do it in a reverse order. Uh, I'll try and address uh, the comment by uh, Professor Ross. Thank you. Um, there is no doubt that consumer surplus is important. Right, uh, my kind of study doesn't dispute that. Uh, what we are trying to do, of course, is to get a better understanding that if you have digital markets in in place, right, uh, it's already generating consumer surplus. But when when these markets are concentrated, uh, how do you monitor uh, some of the effects of the company strategies on the distribution of the consumer surplus itself. Uh, a key problem uh, with studying consumer surplus is this information asymmetry. There has been, um, there's been two major studies of consumer surplus, one by Amazon, uh, done by Amazon researchers, one in, this, in Indonesia done by, I think, Grab, uh, in collaboration with Grab researchers. And uh, what these companies typically do is what you said, they try to prove what is the benefit. Uh, there is no, we are not doubting the benefit. We are, we are trying to analyze ways in which to, to monitor how firms that are already generating consumer support, how they are competing and how when they change their market strategy and when the market structure change, for example, through mergers, how are consumer surplus changing in terms of the distribution? The information asymmetry is quite, quite significant in a sense that, uh, for example, data is not available to study uh, pre-merger and post-merger impact on consumer surplus. It's a difficult thing to study because uh, some of the problems highlighted by Apat Chaikal on the ability of algorithms to do very personalized pricing which further extracts that kind of uh, consumer surplus that we have. So to do that kind of study would be then require these companies to give access to, to, uh, out, you know, to, to look at uh, the kind of pricing behavior that occurs uh, before the merger and after the merger. Uh, there was a big period before like in single before the entry of uh, Gojek into Singapore, there was a period where only Grab was the only com uh, major dominant company and all the fares went up, there were no discounts. So obviously a reduction in consumer surplus and things like that. Uh, so there's no dispute on, on, on the benefit, but what is required is uh, a bit more study on that. Even in the computer simulation, it's extremely difficult to, to, to indicate uh, to do a consumer surplus element, what assumptions do you make when consumers are quite heterogeneous in terms of their willingness to play? Uh, how do you then sort of like calibrate the model by estimating in, you know, getting some empirical estimate of what the, uh, the, the willingness to pay distribution looks like in a, in a typical uh, market like that. Uh, the consumer surplus also have 
important policy implication that is to for policymakers to think about if consumers are valuing uh, sort of like ride sharing services that much, what does it say about the quality of alternative services in terms of public transport and the kind of public investments that are needed uh, for uh, lower income groups, you know, that may not be able to afford uh, some of these uh, services. So that might be one of the kind of things. So I'm not disputing the importance of consumer surplus, except that uh, it's an important element that needs to be researched, which of course has this tremendous data availability gap that prevents researchers, even uh, in the government, I think, to examine uh, this, this kind of issues, I think, in, in detail. Um, uh, but Chaika gave a lot of interesting comments, and I will, I will try and address uh, uh, some of this. Um, uh, how much time do I have? Sorry. Maybe another two minutes. Um, two minutes, okay. Um, I'll just quickly run through. Uh, network stability is extremely important. Uh, you can see that as, as uh, changes in strategies that affect uh, cost switching, uh, for example, multi-homing requirements by competition regulators. Uh, this is part of things that, that are, are monitored. And one of the things that, that is interesting is the stability is, there's another dimension of stability that Chaika doesn't talk about, is the multi-layer of networks. For example, a lot of uh, companies have, have different services. You, you offer ride sharing, but you also have payment system. And you have a different network, two layers of network that are interrelated that, that can actually affect uh, the competition, including non-price effects uh, that, that filter, filter through. Um, the importance of who is setting the price algorithm platform versus seller. This is an important issue. Um, in a survey we did, uh, we, we did do a, a survey, although not in English, on Singapore, precisely figure this out. How uh, in, in e-commerce markets, how are algorithms used? Uh, they provided by platform or they themselves use it. And we investigated what kind of sellers use design platform versus what kind of sellers rely on on, uh, on to buy uh, software and things like that. Micro-targeting is extremely important. Um, I agree on that completely. Uh, extremely difficult to do on simulation, like I said, because you need that consumer characteristic preferences uh, to fit in to that. Uh, in that regard, um, the issue of price tested collusion and price discrimination is not a versus. You can do both, right? Typically, in reality, I think what happens is you can do both. You can do a tacit collusion, and you can also do price discrimination. That two category may not necessarily be, be uh, exclusive. Um, uh, menu costs. Uh, there is evidence we found in our survey that higher uh, more use of algorithm result in more uh, price change and multiple equilibrium. When you do simulation, you also do that. When you run one simulation, you can see part dependence. Uh, and when you rerun the same simulation, you get a different kind of part uh, trajectory. So it does indicate that you, the, the possibility is there. You know, it's not just, you in theory, uh, in reality. That's why computation agency is important to look at the data even more carefully when there are part dependent issues that can affect uh, the results that, that you, you observe. Um, the importance of um, cost structure is very important. Uh, you can see that in some of the data I showed that some of the price changes emanates not necessarily from the algorithm, but it could be from the wholesaler uh, side that, that sets the price. So when you look at a digital platform selling multi-product, it's important to look at the different product which can be, a firm may have 1,000 product, but it's possible that 50 of those or 200 may not be using price algorithm due to, due to arrangement with certain wholesaler uh, would be an important issue. I think competition agency 
uh, look at that in, in greater detail. That raises a whole lot of different different issues on vertical uh, retail side, uh, price maintenance issue. Uh, We've uh, got uh, more questions in the box, so um, yeah. would that be all, all right to move on to um, next yeah, question? Yeah, maybe some yeah. of these other questions I can. <laughs> and yes. uh, Lily mentioned a lot of point about digital divide. I think I completely agree. Um, some of these issues are related because we do see in our survey that algorithmic pricing depends on uh, firms' digital readiness. And awareness is also important uh, on, 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 on the part of seller as well as uh, on, on the part of buyer. Yes. Thank you so yeah, much, yeah. Dr. Lee. Um, so, um, so we've got questions in the chat box, but uh, in case uh, Bart Chaikal and Ibu Lili has anything to add um, uh, for Dr. Um, uh, Ross's question, um, maybe one minute each, because we're really pressed for time. Um, if, um, Ibu Lili first, maybe? Uh, I'm good. Just continue to other questions. Thank you. Thank you, really. But, but Chaiko, anything to add? Yeah, I think that's a very uh, uh, important question from Prof. Uh, Ross McLeod, right? This, but yeah, I don't know. Even in the conventional industry, right, there is no. It's very I don't know. Rare, rarely study on the impact of collusion. Uh, the impact of collision behavior to welfare on maybe like banking competition, right? <laughs> we have many about corruption, corruption costs in the country, but nevertheless, we, do, we don't ever know. Yeah, for sure, there is a market concentration in banking, but I don't think there is a, you know, study in Indonesia, especially for uh, measuring the cost of banking collusion. <laughs> That's that's all. Uh, thank you, thank you, Pat Chaika. So, Pat Ross, you've really invigorated a lot of ideas on this issue. So, to move on to the next question, to question to Dr. Lee. So, we've got two questions. The first one from Maya Yang from Smeru. So, um, she's asking how the KPPU as regulators help our drivers and restaurants get fair platform prices and healthy partnerships. And then we also have a really interesting question from uh, Kaki Kinaoli. Um, she's asking whether there are other uh, methodologies and options to um, figure out whether companies um, companies collude other than um, your suggested methodology of looking at whether prices correlate. And then we also have a third question, if we can throw it in. So uh, to Dr. Lee um, from uh, Matrio. Um, and he's asking whether it's possible for sellers to monopolize the marketplace by using price algorithms. So Dr. Lee, um, the floor is yours. Yeah, on, on the first question, um, whether you, you, how do you look at uh, complaints regarding fees imposed by online food? So uh, when you look at some of the competition uh, cases that I highlighted in the table, these are contractual issues that are related to vertical restraints. And what KPPU would have to look into would be to look at exactly how uh, the uh, contract's written, how does it, whether it impedes competition and, and things like that. Uh, so certainly this is uh, the way to kind of look at it. In terms of the platform price, uh, I'm not entirely sure uh, whether one can deal with this, uh, how one should deal with this uh, uh, this issue. Uh, again, it, would, it might require looking at uh, how the price mechanism uh, works in terms of whether uh, there is a distributional issue, of course, whether um, when you have certain kind of price uh, mechanism, how does, does that, including attendant, uh, sort of like uh, clauses, uh, the fee that is charged, is collected by the platform, uh, the discounts it gives, who bears that, those kind of detailed matters in assessing the distribution of uh, what we talked about earlier, the, the consumer surplus across the different, different layers of participants, I think. Uh, this is something that, that can be done, but requires a bit more study. On the question by Risky, uh, where, whether you basically um, you can observe collusion in the poly if price correlate. Uh, 
Well, whether when you use Bertrand type competition, well, a lot of the, the simulation models that have been done, uh, like Calvano, etc., uses exactly the Bertrand type. Bertrand is just a model where the firm uh, set prices rather than quantity. And what they do is then they embed a sort of like a, uh, a uh, reinforcement learning mechanism in a Bertrand model to get that collusive uh, outcome in a Bertrand model, right? Uh, my idea is that uh, in, in my current work is to enrich that further to then look at a spectrum of different learning mechanism uh, that we are familiar with. The, the highest level would be deep learning where to see um, what, how fast can you get the convergence to collusion and uh, how, how maybe you can't even get converge, convergence as some people argue. So it's a question of varying, not just the model is standard, but varying the learning, learning mechanism and this is useful for regulators to better understand what you're looking at. For example, if you're look, if you're investigating, you're looking at particular algorithms. How should the algorithms look like? What tweaks in the algorithm will give you what result? I think that requires. Uh, that is the benefit of that simulation is to just kind of train yourself, but to look at how the coding is done to translate. The, the economic model into codes that then translate into real uh, pricing. Is it possible for seller to monopolize the marketplace by using price algorithm, which in reality, consumer always chooses the lower price? Uh, by this, I mean some sort of predatory pricing. Yes, in our earlier simulation, we did uh, a sort of predatory pricing in terms of understanding what what sort of price threshold would tip the market into a firm getting all the cons uh, all the sort of monopolized or not monopolized getting uh, more and more of the consumers we do see this attempt at price war in in some markets like, like price right sharing in different different periods and the importance of um here the importance that pachaika mentioned path dependence is quite crucial in some cases, when you run the simulation, although one company prices it very, very low, you cannot completely eliminate another company uh, from the market. It will have a small share, but it cannot completely eliminate. Then the issue of the economies of scale that Pachaika comes in may play into a role, uh, play a role. So, so it's a complex market which requires that kind of understanding that what are you observing? What's the role of part dependence when you have predatory market. And a lot of evolutionary algorithms show that when you have competition in a spatial dimension, you can have uh, a market where uh, a winner take all doesn't completely happen, I think. Um, so that's something that you can sort of like understanding. And when you look at real world data, perhaps that's something that you, you kind of like want to observe when two companies are undertaking price war, what are the market share especially is uh, is evolving towards and what conclusion can you make in terms of the uh, the desirability of this kind of uh, price war and driving out uh, one company versus another. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee. Um, your, your, your topic has really, really um, 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 garnered a lot of interest. And although we're pressed for time, maybe we can, ha uh, we can have one more question. And please, may I um, welcome Professor Hal Hill um, to ask his question. Professor, please, please, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks, Nikki. And uh, thanks to all the speakers for a really stimulating uh, session. And uh, nice to see you also, Casey and Lily. Haven't seen you in person for a while. So nice to see you. Uh, Casey, it may be an obvious question, but uh, I'm standing back uh, about your analytical framework in which you're sort of couching your analysis. So we all grew up thinking about competition with the standard structure conduct performance model. And then, you know, contestability was added to it a bit. Is that the kind of, I think it's the implicit framework that you're still working in, but maybe you want to just elaborate how much that kind of analytical framework is really changed, especially when markets and technology are inevitably moving faster than the regulators can be. So 
It's a sort of obvious question, but I'd just be curious if you could tease it out a little bit. Maybe not today because time's out. And I just wanted to reinforce a point Lily made. I think it's very important, Lily, thanks for reminding us about the digital digital divide. Uh, just for example, everyone probably knows this, but yesterday at a webinar we were told that in Indonesia, only a little over one third of women in rural areas have access to internet. So it seems to me that uh, it, we've got to have this very fancy uh, analytical work, important work that Casey's doing, and we really appreciate it. But I guess the sort of stepping stone or foundation stone is we really need that internet access to make it all work, don't we? And especially if there's a an, an inequality divide that is, you know, location, geography and gender. But, uh, thanks again and really enjoyed the session. Yeah, um, nice to hear your voice again. <laughs> um, yeah, the issue of uh, structure. Yeah, there has been an evolution of 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 in terms of uh, the intellectual foundations, even underneath underlying competition policy. Right, you're right. The structure conduct performance, uh, which of course then evolved into uh, not evolved but added contestability, then added the game theoretic uh, kind of analysis. Um, what we have here is a hybrid situation. Much of the competition agency kind of approach as, uh, uh, is still influenced by structure conduct performance. When every time you invoke the use of the Herfindahl index, for example, mm. uh, that leads to a sort of a use of that. But then when when competition agency look at cases, uh, they definitely look at market contestability, entry barriers, and things like that. So that becomes that is still relevant. Uh, the theory one bit more difficult to, to analyze. Uh, analytically, it's nice, but the data is difficult. A lot of the ongoing work um, actually is along that line, but using a different kind of model to, to, to understand. Uh, a lot of the simulation, for example, that we do uh, is game theoretic kind of uh, modeling, uh, but in a more dynamic sense where we, we, we then enrich it. So these are all supplementary kind of approach. Of course, um, because of the, the point I made that technology has changed, the importance of data, non-price element, uh, ability to do personal pricing also changes the the the, the kind of uh, approach you want to do when you analyze uh, competition policy analysis uh, of that. So a hybrid approach, pretty much eclectic. Um, the rural divide issue is 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 really really important. Um, one of the one of the one of the research I tried to carry out but not very successful was we we tried to collect data on prices for products in physical stores, which I presume the some of the lower income or disadvantaged group would, would pay, versus prices of online prices. Um, in wanting to estimate, uh, this is again the issue of consumer surplus that uh, Ross raised, right? How much does it differ in online markets versus physical stores? And how much algorithmic pricing alters this consumer surplus that you obtain in physical versus? And this is complex because there are stores which are 100% online. There are stores that are physical, owner of physical stores, but have online stores. And this matters because when you look at the pricing behavior, uh, firms that use algorithmic pricing, 100% seems to be those which are completely online stores. Firms don't use pricing algorithms, likely to be firms that have a physical present, a physical store, as well as online. So somewhat there, there's a need to kind of like uh, make the price consistent with that. Uh, I don't know whether it's related to what Pat Chaikal mentioned, whether it may, do consumers buying from physical stores, if it vary from minutes by minutes or second by second, it will be too confusing for uh, for your pachi and machi, right? Let's say if you're going to a store, you want to buy your milk, right? You look at the price and then you go and buy vegetable. You turn back half an hour to 10 minutes later, the price of the milk has changed. It has increased by five cents or ten cents, and the machi will know it, uh, and that's like crazy, right? So that could be a constraint in terms of that's still a behavioral element that I think Chaikal does research. 
when you buy from a physical store, what is the behavioral impact when you <laughs> is there one or should we have one day uh, algorithmic pricing completely also in physical store? Then that's very complicated. Like how are you gonna like? Do you wait for the price to go down in five minutes, ten minutes, and buy, or how do you even uh, adopt pricing in that kind of market? So that relates to this digital divide market structure and how do you price and consumer surplus all bundled up in a very complicated way. Yeah. Sorry, thank I might answer that. No, thank you, Dr. Lee. That was amazing. I mean, I guess before I end uh, our discussion today, um, if, if really, if you, if you have any, any comments um, to Professor, Professor Howe Hill, um, comment. Well, I don't have any particular to Professor Halhill, but uh, if you ask me to provide like the final comments, is that very Yes, please. Okay? Yes, yes. Yeah, thank uh, you. Really. <laughs> well, okay. I think like, well, first of all, thank you so much for Professor Lee and other speakers and commentators and questions. I think we have very intriguing discussions. Uh, the recent developments of robots, automations and AI has improved overall human welfare, I totally agree with Ross and other um, um, commentators in, in the case that it is our responsibility to ensure that they are human centric and manage the level of playing field so that we have access to goods and services at fair competitions. Because not only uh, algorithms in pricing, but also the choices, for example, like digital platforms, or services provider, before we even go to the pricing, uh, do, do we have choices to choose which kind of methodology of payments, right? Do we have choices to choose any kind of services in delivery? You know, so that kind of not only uh, algorithm in pricing, but also services, competitions in services and other related services in digital trade and digital transformations era. So this kind of, I think it's all our responsibility. Uh, I'm glad that we have the head of KPPO here today with us, uh, particularly Indonesia. I think we really need to work on antitrust or competitions policy law. And I'm very much delighted to have uh, Professor Lee presentations today. Thank you. Thank you, Ibuili. Um, Bayat Chaita, if you have any final words, um, please go ahead, Bayat Chaita. Yeah, Nikki, uh, I think I learned a lot from Professor Lee and maybe, yeah, I don't know. I think I, I start to have interest on the, how the the behavior of <laughs> the price uh, in the platforms, right? But the, the most difficult is, is the data accessibility, right? So the platform will not be give you an access because you want to scrutinize eyes. So it will be like KPPU will be the one who maybe have rights to the data. So that's all for me. Uh, thank, you. thank you. Thank you, Pai Chai And thank you, everyone. Dr. Lee, your topic is just so interesting. It has invigorated a lot of interest. And I think maybe more than one person, more than Pai Chai I mean, I wish I had more time. <laughs> I, know, yes, I, wish, I wish we all we, we, yeah. we had more time too. And uh, but unfortunately, um, um, the those two hours just flew by um, because of uh, the, the the really interesting discussions we've had. Um, we I'd like to thank our eminent speakers, Dr. Lee, of course, Ibu Lili, Pai Chaika, for the very vibrant and insightful discussion that um, you have all given us. Um, I give sincere gratitude again to Professor Saparina Sadli and the Sadli family for joining us today. We also thank our amazing participants, um, all those amazing questions, Pat Ross, Professor Hal Phil, Kaikiki, Mayang, and Matrio, um, um, so many questions and so many interesting topics to, um, to, to hear. Thank you also to the amazing organizers of this lecture, colleagues from LPRM and the NU Indonesia Project, Ibulidia, Ibuliatu, and everyone, um, Vania. It's really re remarkable and oh, to the positive side of technology that despite this pandemic, we're all still able to be together to talk about solutions to the challenges we're all facing. And um, and um, it, it truly gives us hope, right? That we can come together and then invigorate this semangat to, um, in Indonesia we say gotong royong or working together to try and find solutions um, to the challenges we face today. 
So we hope that this um, webinar uh, will be the start of many discussions uh, to come on um, regulations and solutions um, to um, the challenges we face as we embrace or continue to embrace the, the digital world. And um, with that note, I thank everyone and um, see you all again in our next um, lecture for next year. And um, thank you so much. And thank you also to mm -hmm. everyone who participated. Um, please take care and stay well and safe, everyone. <laughs>